course, my name is Jeffrey Schulman. And uh, basically, I've had a long career in the music industry. I, I uh, have done many jobs, uh, kind of both sides of the table, so to speak. Started in this business when I was going to college. Uh, it's pretty funny. I didn't have any money to finish college and needed a job, or I was going to have to drop out of school and get a real job. Um, and I started as part-time Christmas help in a record store. And uh, remember those? Uh, you're too young. You don't remember <laughs> record stores very well, probably. Uh, but I started in a record store and ended up managing that record store within a year and stayed with that company that owned those record stores for about seven years. Loved music. I'm a terrible musician who vicariously lives my life through real musicians. And so I decided I had to get into the music industry beyond the retail store. And I started marketing and promoting the artists that we were selling in the store to a degree that one day a record label called on me. It was A&M Records. And they said, who are you and how come you sell so many of our records? And I said, well, here's what I do. And they hired me. <laughs> so my first job was at a record label in 1977. And uh, I did marketing for A&M Records in the uh, central and south Texas market. Lasted about two years before that ended, and start liked it so much. I started my own business, and I did tour support, marketing for art, mainly artist managers. I would go out on the road in front of artist tours, and I would basically make sure that the marketing stuff was set up in advance, uh, get people to the shows, promote, and be one day ahead of the show, basically, to get people there. I don't do that anymore. That's one of those jobs that has come by the wayside. Um, did that for a long time, managed a few artists, got my feet wet with that. And in 1984, got a phone call from Island Records, and who hired me to do, of all things, radio promotion. Went to work for Island, uh, stayed with them for a few years. They moved me to Los Angeles in 1980, whatever it was, don't remember anymore. Uh, a year later, I wasn't working for Island anymore. I was at Arista Records doing more radio promotion basically called at every rock and roll station west of the Mississippi River. Uh, didn't want to do that any longer, and happily a friend of mine named David Anderley, who is one of my mentors in this industry, uh, called me from A&M Records, oddly enough, and hired me back into the A&R department at A&M Records. And uh, I was the director of A&R administration, and I lasted there for quite a few years. They were purchased by Polygram Records in 1991, I believe it was. And uh, it suddenly turned into a much more corporate atmosphere, and it wasn't for me. Uh, I wasn't for them either. They wanted a different kind of person there, and I resigned, moved back to Texas, and started an artist, artist management firm. A friend of mine here who was already managing artists, Kevin Womack. And we basically managed artists, started a production company, did a deal with BMG, whereby we would find artists for them. Uh, and we would be their production company, we started a publishing company, we managed many artists, had artists on to Geffen, Epic, uh, I don't even remember all the labels, uh, and many indie labels, got firmly entrenched in the indie label market, loved it so much. Uh, I had did have stints at IRS in the meantime, and prior to that, several other indie labels, and I just loved the indie world, and indie rock was my life, and I loved the, the whole punk indie scene that was growing up in the 80s and the, into the 90s, so that's where I specialized, and um, managed bands that, that uh, played at Southeast, but then I grew up and decided I wanted to not travel so much, and uh, raise my child, and I got a phone call from a college, and they said, how would you like to teach what you've been doing all your life, and I said, oh damn, <laughs> oh yeah. And so I took a job with Austin Community College in Austin, Texas. I've been there 11 years now with the department chair, and we have a great time. Lots of talented kids there, and I'm, now I'm managing about 400 kids, I think. <laughs> now, I think it's very helpful, and in the music industry, you need to be a switch hitter. I mean, it, especially in, today, in this day and age when, when you know, there's four companies control about 85% of everything, and that doesn't mean just record labels. That's the same companies that have publishing companies getting involved in merch deals now and, and they're trying to do these 360 deals with artists where they want to basically want a piece of the other. That's what a manager does. They're trying to do what a manager does. Um, I think you have to know a lot about everything nowadays. And in fact, um, I tell people that you ought to learn how to do your own damn websites. Go buy Dreamweaver. Go learn Photoshop and, and learn how to get your presence out there on the web. In addition to learn how to book a gig, learn how to collect money
money from a drunk club owner um, and learn how to build a fan base and learn how to get out there and do what you got to do. DIY is its own thing. Your mama told you right. Your mama said, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Uh, back when I was managing artists assigned to labels, I actually would do marketing plans. I would go to the label and say, this is what we expect. This is how we think this artist should be marketed because you couldn't expect them to do that. Uh, I saw when I was at major labels, I saw them screw up so many careers. Um, it was disappointing. I, I mean, my dream sort of got injured, I think, uh, being in so many major labels. Uh, there's some great music and some great people working those labels and even running those labels. Um, but there's too much at the time, you know, the priorities being what they are. I think a lot of careers got ruined and had their managers known a lot more and they been more experienced, they might have been able to go out and do much more on their own than ever, they ever accomplished with a major label. There's nothing to fear in that. In fact, it's the only way you're going to make it now. Uh, unless you want to be on American Idol. And I don't recommend that. Well, I, I guess I recommend it for people that want to do that. But most of the people I know don't want to do that. Um, I think you need to really get out there and not be afraid of the unknown. And you just have to make sure that you can eat a lot of ramen and, and still have energy and, and find a lot of sleepless nights because you're working. Um, meet a lot of people and just get out there and work. It's, it's not an easy thing. Don't go out there expecting to be a rock star or a pop star. I think people have the misguided notion that this is a glamorous business. Um, it's a business you get into because you're compelled. It's something that comes from inside of you. Um, and not just the artists. I mean, the people who work with the artists have to have that same thing inside. Um, so you really need to uh, find out what needs to be done and just do it. Um, if that means having a day job, slinging veggie burgers somewhere or something, that's okay. There's no shame in that because you're working towards an ultimate goal. If someone wants to be a manager, the first thing I say to them is don't quit your day job. And why? And I think I'll try to talk you out of it. If that doesn't work, I'd pat them on the back and wish them a lot of luck and say, okay, let's rock. And I'll start talking to them. Honestly, if you want to be a manager, um, I think you're crazy. Uh, but in a good way, because it means that you really care to be a manager. Um, you have to have a great love of music. You have to be uh, someone who can troubleshoot situations. You have to be uh, able to work with a number of different people at a time. I, I often describe a manager as the axis on which the wheel turns. And I like to give this image of, you know, here's the the attorney over here and here's the booking agent and maybe a record label and merchandising and, and, and even charitable organizations which I think you should be working with. All of this the manager takes care of the business and artists often get upset with that analogy and I say, no, no wait a minute, let's, let's put this in a different perspective. The artist is, the, is the, the earth and the moon's rotating around the earth but you, the artist, are the star that we all rotate around. <laughs> so it's sort of a parallel thing. Um, but you really are the business half of a relationship that is a very, you know, very, um, very symbiotic relationship. Uh, the artist-manager relationship is a very important thing to establish early that uh, an artist does need a manager because they, if they're only doing the art, they won't understand the business stuff. They need a manager to teach them. And a manager, on the other hand, has nothing without the music. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. What does a manager do? Well, a manager does everything. Uh, as a manager, um, in my career, I uh, first thing I would have to do is find artists, because what am I without music? So I'd have to find great artists, and uh, usually we would look for artists who didn't already have a revenue stream, because it wasn't about finding artists who are already making money. I mean, I wish we could, it'd be nice. But we would try to find artists we loved, We'd have to be, you know, I mean, I have to literally be blown out of my shoes to want to work with an artist uh, because there's a lot of sweat and blood in there. Um, then the next thing you do is find out if that artist wants to work with you. Uh, once you get that out of the way and it looks like it's going to be a lovely relationship, then you really have to put together some sort of an agreement. Um, so as a manager, you have to understand uh, contract law. 
You have to be able to negotiate those agreements, starting with the artist, proceeding through record deals, publishing deals, any ancillary type of things, like uh, if your artist writes great music and you want to get it in, in a film, indie films are great. Uh, sometimes you do it for nothing. Sometimes you do it just so you, the artist will get some performance royalties down the road somewhere and get their name in a, in a film that some director is going to do well with and maybe you have something on the back end, some arrangement worked out. Um, so managers have to kind of know the film business these days. If you don't know the internet, you're a fool. You have to know how to use the internet. You have to know how to use any new technologies, including recording technologies. You don't have to be an expert, but you've got to know what are the tools of the trade? How can I get my artist to the public? How can they blossom into this thing that people are going to love and actually want to go see live and buy their, their music? The biggest changes that I've seen in the industry uh, in my time has really been the, uh, the explosion of the major labels into these behemoths that have become unwieldy in, in a sense. Um, and the regrowth, something that I'm really, I'm a 60s guy, so I, used, I loved the old independent record labels, uh, starting with the psychedelic era, and um, that was my youth. And now I kind of like seeing that resurgence of the indie stuff again. It's coming back in a big way and has been really since the 80s and the 90s. Um, but even now more so, I think that the internet has leveled the playing field with the distribution changes. One of the changes I don't like is the fact that uh, kids today seem to be disloyal to artists. They're, they're song-oriented and they just want that song and then they forget it and they move on to the next artist and we're not building careers. There are artists who deserve entire careers and should have a lifelong career. Um, and albums are complete works of art sometimes. Now, there's a lot of crap out there given that the major labels look for one hit or two hits on an album and the rest is trash, but that's not what the indie world is about. And An indie artist wants to make a complete work of art, and I think that's a, that's a really beautiful thing. Uh, so I, I would like to see kids get back into albums as opposed to just songs. But, you know, you got to go where the market is. If, as a manager, it's your, one of your goals is to make sure your artist can eat and has a place to live when they get off the road. How have the changes impacted the manager and the way they do their job. I think a manager has become much uh, larger in the artist's life. Um, one of the big controversies in today's uh, music world is the 360 deals that major labels want to do with artists whereby they own a piece of everything the artist does. And I am, uh, I just think that's, a, for a major label, I think that's a wrong-minded attitude. Uh, some indie labels, maybe, but that's what a manager does. A manager is a 360 deal because he's sharing the revenue from everything that's professionally associated with that artist's entertainment career. Now, if they want to open a barber shop, you're not going to share in that unless you finance it or something. But anything they do, whether a playwright or if you, or uh, they write film music or they tour or they, and they make albums, um, anything they do, they have a music website where they're doing stuff. You are a part of all that, and you are going to share in all of that, and uh, that's much more than it used to be. Uh, the internet didn't exist much before the 90s, I mean it did, but I mean, I, I remember my first artist website that I got up there was probably in the, I guess 94, something like that, and it worked really well then. I can't imagine how great it is for people now. I mean. You know, you gotta you gotta know about MySpace and when not to use MySpace. You gotta know when to have your own website. You gotta know, are they an indie artist? Are they should they do their own music? I mean, there's just so many things out there to do. It's an artist manager never sleeps. It's a 24/7 job. It's like being a parent. A manager and a label aren't that dis, uh, dissimilar in a lot of ways. Uh, both should be interested in the uh, the the well-being and future of that artist. Uh, neither one has a job without that music, uh, so music comes first. Um, the difference lies in, in the fact that a label ha used to have no vested interest beyond the sales of a physical product called a CD or a vinyl album before that or whatever. Labels today, I mean, there's downloads, there's, there's multiple download sites. There's, uh, there's still CDs, there's vinyl is coming back for some artists, um, but you also have the live tours, you've got uh, internet sites where, where you might sell music that you didn't in the past. Um, the area they are alike is that 
everything is for the artist. That's who you should be working for. Um, you make your money via their career. Um, where you differ, a manager is a much more personal relationship. You actually are involved in the day-to-day -day everything for the artist, whereas a label should not get involved like that. Labels work with many more artists. I read an article uh, a few weeks ago that I thought was very interesting that said perhaps the new record label in the future will be the artist and their manager. And I thought that was very interesting and I, I honestly see that happening all the time and I don't know that that wasn't the way before because when I had my artist sign the labels, I worked intimately with those labels in, in trying to get them to do everything. I, everything from where do they place the advertising to, to how many CDs go to this store or, you know, where are we going to go on tour and how are you going to support us? Well, managers deal in all of that on a daily basis. What does a manager look for? Number one, music. Kick my ass. <laughs> and if you can't do that, can you kick that kid's ass or that kid's ass or that one up there? You've really got to have artists who are extremely talented and understand that it's it's all about, it is about them. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm this, you know, nutty groupie, but it is so much about the music that's coming from that artist and what is the message they have to give and what are they contributing to the world via their music. Um, that's how you find an artist. When you feel you've got that thing and there's something inside of you that's special. I mean, I gotta have the hair in my arm stand up when I go see them. I remember the last artist I actually signed to a, to a management contract. My business partner and I went to see them and after their first show, it was terrible. They were too loud. We couldn't hear anything. We laughed our butts off. It was amazing how bad the show was, but we saw something beautiful. I mean, it was, the potential was there. These kids just blew me away. And they went on to have a really nice career, a lot of indie labels, got them on a major for a while, and they had a great, great run at it. And uh, I'm still, I still keep up with those guys. So uh, it was great. I mean, you just gotta find an artist that inspires you and that you think will inspire others. I don't think an artist needs to have a revenue stream established to find a manager. It's a, not a bad idea, but many managers will sign an artist just based on having their butt kicked by their music. Because as, if, you're, if all you're looking is for is someone to be a cash cow, then you're not about the music. Uh, you have to understand that you must earn a living. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. But you still have to understand this is about art, and this is about communication, and this is about politics, and religion, and sex, and everything else. So if you just say, well, it's about money, then don't come to my door. <laughs> don't ask me any questions, don't talk to me, because that's not someone I would want to do business with. When does an artist need a manager? That's a good question. I tell an artist they need a manager at the point uh, in their career where they can no longer handle the business side of what they do. I recommend that every artist self-manage for as long as they possibly can, but when they get to the point where that is no longer feasible because they got so much going on, a manager will find them. You don't find a manager. Remember, managers need artists more than artists need managers. <laughs> and so it's up to the managers to find those artists. And, and I don't recommend artists go around looking for a manager. I just recommend they do everything they're supposed to do, do it well, and when the time comes, there will be a manager there who will be willing to work with them. In order to have a, su a successful relationship from an artist and manager perspective, you, first of all, you gotta like each other. Um, you have to believe in each other, believe in each other's abilities to do the job that needs to get done. Um, but it's about the music. It's really about the music. And I just can't stress that enough. As long as the artist is, is compelling in their music, a manager shouldn't have a tough time getting stuff going on. Now, they may not have huge amounts of money coming in because luck and timing are so much of the equation here. But uh, as long as that artist is making great music, and as long as the manager is doing their job and they still like each other, I think you still have a very strong working relationship. It is, it's like, it becomes like family. Uh, I always told my artists I, they would never starve when they, they were my clients as a manager. I said, when, I don't want you eating ramen. I said, you know, come to my, my house and sit at my dinner table 
as long as I've got money and I'm feeding my family, you're in my family, I'm going to feed you. I'm not going to pay your rent for you, but I will feed you. Uh, but it's that kind of relationship where you actually become that attached to the artist and if you believe in them and you see their potential, you are going to do anything you can within reason to make sure that their potential is realized. If the artist is, does well, the manager will make good money. And yes, a manager should ask for 20% of their gross income now, I'm not going to lie about that. A manager is going to spend a lot of money in the, in the pursuit of this artist's career. And a manager is going to spend maybe $20,000 uh, to record you know, some, some tracks and manufacture a CD or get it online and buy a van or something so the artist can go out on tour, but that's okay. If a manager has that kind of money, that's more money than some people spend on their kids, you know? Uh, but you're willing to do that because you understand there's something there. Yeah, it's, it's an investment in your future as well. They say it takes money to make money. If you want to get down the business side of it, of course it does. And a manager should be willing to invest. Um, Artist needs to understand that and not freak out at, at uh, you know, some of the things a manager does that might piss them off, like talk about, well, there's this company that wants one of your songs for a commercial, and if it's something that fits in with the lifestyle of that artist, maybe they should consider it. But you should never push anything like that, because if your artist is dead set against something like that, then you're a sinner for even bringing it up. But if you think artists think might like that, what's wrong with that? Um, if your artist is, is political, which I tend to like those kinds of artists, I think it's a great idea for your artist to be involved in political movements and to be involved in, in social movements and, uh, and play a few gigs for free, do things for the cause. I think that's a very good thing. Um, it gets you fans. If you want to look at it from a crass viewpoint, hey, it gets you fans. Um, but it's doing your part of giving back. When fans give to you, you have a, in turn have an obligation to give something back to them. We just saw Billy Bragg, and there's a man who lives by that. And it sure inspired me to see him again. <laughs> what advice would I give to someone interested in working in a record label? Let's see. First, I would say uh, start a record label. You're crazy. I don't know that there will be labels in five years or ten years, but hell, do it. If that's what you want to do, you've got to do it. You've got to understand that a label now isn't going to be what a label was. Uh, maybe you need to reinvent the record label. Um, really, the, the function of a record label is simply to be a conduit for artists to set their music to an electronic medium and, and give people something to take home. So you go to the show, it's over, you love the artist, where's their music? You know, I love satellite radio and, and uh, I love getting on the internet and listening to all kinds of music. But the fact of the matter is sometimes I want to hear what I want to hear, when I want to hear it, and I'm not big on subscription services. So how do I do that? Well, I buy product, whether it's a digital delivery or it's a CD that I bought somewhere or vinyl, which I love. Uh, I buy it, and a record label supplies that. A record label pays for the recording, and they market the recording uh, in whatever the format, and that's import an important part of this equation. Uh, artists depend on labels to spread their music out. Uh, and when you are an artist in leaving a town that you just played in, you want a legacy be left behind. And a record label supplies that legacy beyond just the fact that you did a kick-ass show. A label will have CDs in the market or vinyl or digital delivery methods that you can buy things. And two weeks later, people go, oh, I missed that show, but I can still buy that music somewhere. So labels provide your legacy for you, and I think that's an important function. Record labels uh, are an interesting beast. The, the funny thing is they're, they come in all sizes and shapes, um, but they all do the same thing. So what I tell people, and since I have worked in many jobs at many record labels, and as a manager I've worked with labels, um, record labels are basically all the same. They have one thing to do, and that's to promote an artist's career, career via the recordings. Uh, at a major label, you just have a lot of people doing it. You have a publicity department, a marketing department, a promotion department, which will work the, you know, the DJs, the clubs, and radio stations. Um, you have international department at, at a major label. You have all these departments. Well, an indie label has to do all the same things. If an artist starts their own label with their manager, they still have to do those things. So I just tell people that, look, 
your competition is everything that is being recorded and sold and marketed out there right now. So what do they do? That's what you've got to do. Only you've got to do it better. And in an indie label, I say, you look, it's maybe you and your sister running the label. Get a bunch of hats. You know, your green hat is your marketing hat. Purple hat, wearing, wearing it backwards is your, when you're working with the DJs. And when you're, when you're running live sound, because, hey, somebody's got to do it, you know? <laughs> because, you know, hey, maybe that's the black hat with the funny, you know, badges all over it. Whatever, you've, you've just got to wear every different kind of hat. Uh, major labels have people that do just about everything. You can't in an indie label, you do it yourself. So I think that's a very important thing to remember. You do the same functions, it's just the level of, uh, of proficiency is, I think, maybe higher in an indie, an indie label because they know more things, because everybody at the indie label does everything. Many people ask me, who does A&R in an indie label? I go, well, the guy that sits at the desk and, and, and answers the phone, because that's the same guy that goes out and finds the artists and probably deals with a C, if they do CDs, the pressing plant and sets up the recording sessions and calls all the, 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 the places where they might market the product and contacts the press and I mean, it's, you do everything, including sweep the floors. A record label is basically, again, I, I mean, I, I sort of harp on this, but it's one thing. Get the artist's music in a form that people can enjoy when the artist isn't there to do it for you, because music's this strange beast. Music doesn't really exist. It only exists when it's played. It's in, considered an intellectual property, uh, which is causing all, wreaking havoc in the world today. Uh, but that is the truth. So, but a record label takes this intellectual property and turns it into something that can actually be marketed and sold which is you know, not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be crass capitalism. It just gives people a means of listening to their favorite music when they want to listen to it at their leisure. Um, so what are the jobs at a record company? The first job would obviously be finding great artists. Everybody does it. That's the A&R, Artists in a Repertoire. One of the things that A&R misses on a lot is they find artists, they don't find repertoire. And that doesn't mean that you find songs for an artist to do that someone else wrote. That means even working with an artist to help them find their best songs and work with them. It's an intimate relationship. Once you get that done, you have to record the album. Um, so, so you also have to deal with, with the technical side and studios and maybe a producer or two, maybe even an outside songwriter. And then you have to understand a little about publishing because you have mechanical royalties to deal with unless the artist or the writers waive their mechanical royalties, which a lot of indie artists and labels do because the indie labels tend to sometimes do deals that are for a share of the profits rather than 12 percentage points, three to the producer and all that garbage. Many of them will waive the mechanicals so the label doesn't do a big upfront payment. You just, when you reach a point where things are, the record's paid for and everything, you share the profits. I think it's a wonderful model to work on. Um, so you got the recording, then the marketing department. At a big label, they have pop marketing, urban marketing, country marketing. Well, in an indie label, you focus on a specific style of music and you have an advantage because the indie label owner is probably someone who is a part of that market. They are actually the target audience. So that's an advantage. You work the streets, you know the clubs, you know the people, you are the fan base. So you know how to get to that fan base. You eat the same foods, you buy your clothing in the same kinds of stores. That's a very big advantage indie labels have. You go to the same websites. Uh, so you actually market to that audience knowing who you are as a person. Uh, then getting on radio is a whole other ball of wax. It's one of the most difficult things to do. But I don't focus on radio much anymore. I kind of think it's nice to have it, but if you don't get it, you've got the whole internet out there. And geez, with satellite radio out there now, I mean, I hear stuff on satellite radio, Sirius and XM, that, you know, terrestrial radio hasn't played in 20 years, you know, even whether by that particular artist or just stylistically, you know, some 19 year old kid who kicks, it kicks butt when they play and everybody wants to hear their music, but terrestrial radio goes, well, it's not, hit music and satellite radio go, yeah, but I got this Stevens Underground Garage or something like that where, geez, man, that's perfect for our show. And honestly, it makes me go buy music. 
So you, you market to places like that. And, you, and, and uh, I don't want to name too many, I don't want to start naming off companies, but, but you find the places that will hit the audience you want. So I think radio promotion is not a dead issue. And there's all these clubs that play music, so you can't forget the DJs. If it's dance music, it's all about the DJs. Uh, if it's urban music, it's, it's so much about the streets and the DJs. Uh, my expertise, what I always was, was rock music and indie rock and punk rock and all that. And it's all about the streets. And, you know, one of my favorite things was to, when my artists were in town, whether I was at a label or, or managing, I'd make sure the clothing stores have my artist's music and make sure that the guy running the soundboard in between bands had the music, uh, lifestyle, any lifestyle stuff. I mean, as a record label, it's your job to make sure those places are, they're not going to sell the music there, but they're going to play the music, people are going to hear the music. I, mean, I don't know how many times you've probably been in a, in a, in a maybe a, looking for a new car stereo and you hear something you go, what was that? Do you know what that music is? And the guy goes, oh yeah, you know, I'm, you know, that's like I got it on this station and this, you know, college station, and, and they're playing this wacky stuff no one has ever, ever listened to before. And you go, well, I'm going to listen to it. I love that. Where do I buy that? I have to have it. it. Happens to me on a weekly basis. So record labels have to make sure promotion has gone from just radio to making sure that people everywhere can hear the music. I mean, it's really gotten to be a big job, and there's, you always have your quality control, you have those jobs where you have, if you are going to make CDs, make sure, one of the things I tell everybody is, if you're a record label, when you get your CDs from the manufacturer, open up every box, make sure the, the sleeve is correct, and then take a few of them out and actually listen to them and make sure it's the right CD, because believe it or not, they mess up sometimes, so you've got to do that job. Uh, but it's really about getting it out there and selling it. And don't forget the press. You've got to deal with the press in every way, shape, form, and fashion, whether it's the zines that are out there that have now turned into web zines, the bloggers, um, the legitimate, if you want to call them that, music websites, uh, every underground press newspaper out there that's still in print and the independent press, not to mention the daily newspapers, because all those kid, daily newspapers have, you know, 20 year old kids that write a music column. And, you know, kids sometimes read that stuff on going to the bathroom or something. You know, they got nothing else to read, so they're going to read the, you know, find the, the entertainment section and read that while they're, you know, on the toilet or something. So it's important to get the press in there. So all of these jobs, major labels do those jobs, but your record label, you start a label, you've got to do those same jobs. It's a lot of work. Not to mention you finance it all. Labels have to adapt to the new ways of doing business. And, and the one that I find that most labels really fail, if not miserably, they, they're not doing all that well, many of them, is they're still, not, they're still not identifying their market. I think it's much more of a niche market than it ever was. And I think they're still failing to, truthfully, to, to, to identify their exact market and figure out how to get those kids to buy these kids' music. Uh, and I think probably they're going, they're going, oh, internet, we're all over the internet now. I got, yeah, yeah, and we got a CDs and CD baby and, 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 and iTunes and, 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 and you know, Rhapsody and, and e-music and blah, 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 you know, and you're like, well, half those people aren't even in business anymore, dude. Didn't you, don't you read the newspapers and you can go on the blogs and see who's still around? They just start, they get crazy. They don't really know it. I think there's a lack of focus. I think you really have to find out, especially for an indie label, because you're not a full service label. When you're an indie label, you focus on the people that are going to buy the music that your artists are producing. And so you have to find out exactly where they are and market directly to them, no matter what it takes. Now, you can't leave the artist out of this equation because the artist is probably the best marketing and promotion person they'll ever have. They themselves need to be involved. They have to understand they have a vested interest in this more than anyone else. It is about their music and they have to understand that it is about art. I will grant you it's about art and it's about culture and society, but it's also about I don't want to work in a shoe store and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to sell anything other than my music and I want a career doing that. So you've got to get interested enough to I call it shameless self-promotion. It doesn't mean crassly go out there and promote yourself. 
It means go out there and let people know what you do for a living, that what you do is an honorable job, that isn't something that, you know, musicians aren't just a bunch of drug-taking, kid-buggering people. Musicians are hard workers, and they have a real function in society. People don't believe that, because half the artists I know don't believe that, and that's, that's wrong-minded. It is a wonderful occupation. If you can make a living at it, I highly recommend it. I wish I was a good musician. I would have done it. Instead, I got into the business side so I could live vicariously through those musicians. Using targeted marketing is easy for a label because, uh, I, like I said earlier, you, you are the target market, so you know where those people go. It's tougher for an artist because you're severely limiting who, where the artist, you know, when, when you're talking to an artist and saying, well, we're going to market this to 50,000 people. They go, well, wait a minute. In the United States, like a few hundred million people now, 300 million people? They go, yes, but uh, we don't have an advertising budget for, you know, for that. Uh, basically, we need to find out, you know, you, you got surfers love you. So we're going to heavily go after publications and websites and that specifically go after that. Man, they make some of the best, you know, surf, skate, snowboard, movie. I mean, the movies all the time, and they love music. You don't get paid much for that, if you get paid at all. But hey, when I've got your, if I as a record label can get your music into a snowboarding film, oh my God, and they love it. These kids are gonna be your loyal fans, and when you start touring all over the country, these kids are gonna remember you from that flick, and they're gonna think you kicked my man, they're gonna love you. <laughs> You're going to go, you snowboard, you know how to do that. I do that too. So it's an identity thing. And I think that's really what you have to do. You have to go after your audience. Beyond selling CDs, there, there's a lot of things you can do with your music beyond the live performance. I'm not big on ringtones because I personally, I'm one of those guys that thinks, uh, I, I, I don't know, I just don't like ring. I don't want to go into it. I just don't like ring, I don't want to buy ringtones. You know, I did buy one ringtone, I have to admit, the Ramones. I had to have it. Uh, but other than that, I think that's a great market for people if they're interested in that. I just like to focus on bigger things. Uh, other markets uh, that, that, that you can go into, placement in films, big. Um, I was a film student in college, so I love that concept. And I think that, that there is a convergence of the arts. Video games, oh man, that's so big right now. And, and of course, EA has it all locked up. Electronic Arts, Steve Snurr at EA has it all locked up. But if it wasn't for uh, video games, my kid wouldn't be a Ramones fan. I tried to get him to listen to the Ramones when he was, you know, probably from the minute he was born. Uh, and he wouldn't listen, but he was playing Tony Hawk, pro, you know? <laughs> and suddenly he goes, Dad, I gotta have this music. And I'm like, you idiot, I've been playing that for you since you were born. <laughs> <laughs> so it was wonderful. You know, Tony Hawk got my kid into the remote. That's cool. So I'm way about getting your music into anything that is, that is a part of the culture because it's, it's, it's all converging, man. You know, more kids today, young males, hear more music in video games than they do from any other medium. I don't think that's true for females yet, but young guys, like say 12 to 25 years old, more music, not that they hear more new music, but they hear the continue. You know, really, I mean, I do. I like games, so I, when I'm playing a game, you know, I'm there, I hear the same song a hundred times in a week sometimes. So, more music than anywhere else. Video games. That's there's a huge market, and if I could get if working with artists, I would love from a label standpoint, a management standpoint, film, video games, some TV shows. You know, for. Uh, I mean, if you, if you can stand the embarrassment of having your show, you know, song being one of those schmaltzy love songs, that's cool, man. I don't mind that. If, you know, if that will help an artist's career, I'm okay with that. If that's what an artist does, that's cool. Uh, I never worked with an artist who particularly wrote those kinds of songs, but, but it's cool for those that do. I think those are called ancillary markets, and I think it's a great thing. People ought to not undersell touring, though. That's where you got to do it. You got to connect with that audience. You got to play live. And if you don't make money at it at first, don't worry, nobody does. Just minimize your losing money. That's what you have to do. An artist used to need a label. I'm not sure an artist needs a label anymore. I think, I think an artist should do it themselves. 
I'm so big on that. Uh, it used to, you used to have to go to a studio that cost $2 million and record your stuff and spend upwards of $50,000 to make a record. Jesus, man. I mean, it's like, those are stupid. When I was working at major labels, we would spend half a million dollars to make a, a record, and sometimes it wouldn't even come out. I mean, talk about the days of waste. I mean, that would make me sick. Um, nowadays, with the technology being what it is, granted, most of the home studios I see still don't make good music because there's the, the rooms are acoustically terrible, so they can't get good, even though they have a nice microphone and, and digitally perfect. I'm an analog guy, but digitally perfect stuff it's still the acoustics of the room have so much to do with it so they don't make great recordings and frankly they don't know what the hell they're doing and so they you know so they didn't get someone to produce it really well you can but you can make a good record for just you know a couple thousand dollars five thousand dollars max and go get a thousand of them pressed their their turnkey operations have some nice artwork and get a cd done if that's what you want to do um, get your stuff on the internet it's not so hard itunes and all those places like that are love indie artists now and so the world is your oyster why would you want a record label i don't think artists should even seek out record labels i think record labels seek out artists and it, the way to get a label to sign you is to make yourself wanted <laughs> go do it become so great that at the bargaining table if you should choose to do that instead of oh great benevolent record label gods, please, oh, please sign me. They're like, you make great music. We can do this and that for you. You can go, I don't know. Let me think about it. Let me call my attorney. <laughs> I think that's a great bargaining position, way better than, than begging to be signed. And if you never get a major label coming after you, who cares? I don't think the future is going to be based on that for most artists, maybe pop artists, but not for most artists. And artists should look for many things when they're look if they are looking to be on a label. Uh, the first thing I'd look for is, are they successful? Look at their roster. Do they know how to work with an artist like me? Do they have a clue? Are they fans of my music? Are they fans of the style of music? Uh, really, that's the big questions. And then, of course, do they have follow through? Will they really do what they say they're going to do? And there's always the selfish question, what's in it for me? Which you have to ask yourself. It does have to come down to that. Because if you want your music marketed out there and you want to be on a label, it is about your music. That's why they exist. If an artist is going to get signed to a label, there's, there's, there's not always. So many labels just do handshake deals. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because those are usually one-off deals. There's not much money involved. And it's a great learning experience. And hey, if it, if it works out, I mean, things are gonna work out. There's snakes in this business just like any other business. And you do have to watch out for the bad guys. Uh, most labels will want you to sign a contract. And if you aren't uh, well-versed in reading legalese and reading between the lines, you do need an attorney. You need someone to help you. And I think the only thing you can do at that point is to find an attorney who is a qualified music industry attorney. Not your Uncle Sam who fixes tickets, sir. Aunt uh, Jane, who is the greatest criminal attorney on earth. No. Find a qualified music industry attorney who understands the intricacies of these whacked out contracts and will understand. And hopefully it'll be one who, um, my greatest bargaining tool when I negotiated, I wasn't an attorney, but I negotiated all my contracts, was if you give me anything over 12 pages, we're not signing it. 12, 15 pages, max. And it's like, forget the boilerplate. We're going to do, a, I, I really don't like the 60 to 90 page agreements. I did do those in the past. My highest legal bill was $35,000 to negotiate a contract. You got to be kidding. Oh, how could I, how could I live like that? And it was just, it was major label deals. So we don't want to do those, you know, anyway. Those days are gone unless, unless you're getting signed to some big label because you're an American Idol kid. Really, today's day and age, 12, 15 pages, more like a letter of intent, but full, full contract without the boilerplate. Let's get the key things down. Let's, let's figure out how long this relationship is. What each other's role, all contract is, is, is an agreement to agree. <laughs> You're saying, I will do this, you will do this, and in the end, we'll have a great relationship. And if there's ever any question, we're like, mm, what did we say we were gonna do? It's in the contract. Or it has language that says, we, oh look, we didn't put it in, but it says we agreed to negotiate in good faith. 
a solution, which means without fighting, we're going to sit down like decent human beings and figure this one out. And I think those are great things. So artists, when they want to sign to a label that does contracts, you got to get someone who's experienced in contract negotiation, not high dollar attorney. I'm not saying you're going to get a high dollar attorney. Just find someone who knows what they're doing. That's all. And someone who's caring about you. Believe in yourself is the thing I have to tell artists. No one will do for you what you're not willing to do for yourself. So beyond believing in yourself, you actually have to take an active role in your career. Don't expect other people to do it for you. Never get so far out of the loop that you don't know what people are doing for you. But you have to take an active role. That's not to say you know, when you have people working with you that you tell them what to do. But know what they're doing. Uh, don't let anything blindside you and, and really know who you are as an artist. Take control of that and work with people that will support that. Egos aside, this isn't an ego thing. This is just about really delivering the message that you have to deliver as an artist. And just know yourself. That's the big thing. What advice would I give someone that wants to be in the music industry? Get a degree in something else in college. <laughs> and forget about it. No. I think if you have a passion for the music industry, that you are compelled to do it, you must do it. Um, and if you want to get into it, do it. I'm one of those guys, I'm a DIY guy. The way I got into the music business was I looked around and said, hey, you're doing that all wrong. And they were like, what do you mean we're doing it wrong? I said, you should be doing it this way. And they're like, who the hell are you? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just telling, just making an observation. The next thing I know, I got a job. And it would turn into a career. So get out there and do it. If you want to be in the music business, don't talk about it. Do it. <laughs> Find an artist if you want to be a manager, if you want to be a label, be a label. Read books, get on the internet. Um, just find out what it is you like about it. There are, believe it or not, I think there are a lot of, I'm a college professor now and I teach how to be in the music. That's what I do, I teach music business. And there are colleges all over the country that do that, mainly community colleges and some four-year colleges. I think it's a great way to learn about it. Um, but just do something, be proactive. Don't worry about money, make enough to live, but just worry about building your career, doing what you gotta do, because, hey man, what else are you gonna do? Cool, thanks so much. Okay, my pleasure.